Good afternoon, everyone. This is our Tuesday, May 28th, regular Board of County Commissioners work session. And on the agenda, we're starting off with the Aspen uh, Airport Air Service Report and update, I guess. And Jim Elwood will present this. Very good. Thank you, Board. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Jim Elwood, the Airport Director. I'm joined today with, um, with the uh, good person, Joseph Pickering, from Mead and Hunt. He's our outside air service consultant. They do analysis work on behalf of the county and the community to look at air service options, dig through data, do those kind of very statistical background kind of feedback uh, that helps us in our discussion with uh, airlines and discussions um, to add service or improve the current service. So today is all about a air service um, kind of strategic plan. Um, some uh, months ago, almost a year ago now, um, we got feedback from the board that you wanted us to take a, a little different slant on, on the air service issue and really start to look at where we are currently in the overall air service issue. Um, the airline industry, as many of you know, is one of the most dynamic industries out there. It's been under a great deal of change and consolidations and mergers. Um, there's quite a few fewer flights uh, than there used to be under the old model of 10, 12, 13 uh, significant airlines in the country, really down to about five major carriers in the system today. So what we're going to do is kind of spend a few minutes looking at how um, the Aspen Pickens County Airport fits into that, what we think are some of the moving parts that uh, we've been working with, um, some base statistical data about um, current conditions, and then uh, we'd like to kind of focus a portion of the conversation on moving forward. So without uh, a lot of further discussion, I'm going to turn it over to Joseph to kind of walk you through these slides and, and of course, entertain the questions that you have. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Board, for the time to pr provide you an update, as Jim talked about, over the next 20 minutes, just to update you on some of the macro industry trends, um, in particular, what are relevant to Aspen and our efforts going forward, some of our options that we've been focusing on, and some things to think about as we progress through our ongoing air service development efforts. So just a little background on trends. Kind of in a macro sense, uh, as Jim was talking about consolidation, obviously fewer airlines, fewer airplanes to go around. The competition for those uh, resources has gotten intense, as we'll talk about, and we'll talk about the aircraft that are capable of serving Aspen and some of those that aren't. And so what we've got is, in terms of applicable airlines, um, you know, fewer doors to knock on, as Jim talked about, if you look over the last decade and the trend certainly is moving towards some of these larger regional jets. I'll talk a little bit more airline by airline as we go through it and we're a small enough group feel free to just stop me as we talk and ask questions as well. We'll try to go maybe go through the presentation first if we're going to be limited by time so let's if we can hold our questions okay. unless there's something just for clarification. Sure. As I talked about, because of the industry contraction, fewer airlines, fewer airplanes, uh, communities have gotten very aggressive in regards to their air service development efforts. Uh, I, I can go into more detail on some of that, but it's safe to say that when we go out and we talk to the airlines, sort of like we did with American, um, they're looking to partner with us on, on some risk mitigate, mitigation. I'll talk more about that. And a big part of it is, is we're seeing a transition with the fleets. Uh, if you actually go into the details, which is what I do day in, day out, and you look at the number of aircraft that are out there in the industry, and you kind of look at the longer term trend line going back to 2000, those combined fleets that have come out of the domestic system are really equivalent to about the entire uh, airlines of an Alaska Frontier and JetBlue combined. So it's not insignificant, the change we've seen over the last decade plus. So that's kind of the macro view. Just looking into the Aspen market and specifically, you know, you have a decent level of service today. This map just highlights um, some of the current seasonal service like Dallas, Houston, Chicago, LA, San Francisco, and then of course the, the year-round Denver, and then some of the historical service. And some of that historical service are things that we're continuing to work on today. So as we'll look on this next slide, Jim talked about a lot of change. And this is just looking in the rear view mirror, if you will. And there's been a lot of change in the Aspen market. And that's not unusual as it relates to the larger industry. You can see that Delta came and went after their acquisition of Northwest Airlines. Uh, 
U.S. Airways because of fleet compatibility issues and other things going on in their system pulled out from the 2008 time period. Uh, we got American coming in, Frontier coming in, pulling out, and so that's my job working with Jim and the Air Service Coalition on staying on top of some of that and, and really um, trying to make changes influence in uh, positive regards towards Aspen efforts. And so you can see there's been a lot of change. We expect more change going forward. We'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. This is just a comparison over the last five years. If, if you look at the changes between Aspen in terms of passenger generation, which is kind of that blue chart on the far left, and you compare that to Vail, which is kind of our closest you know, peer competitor, in relation, we've done pretty well in comparison to some of the other ski destinations as well. So even though we've seen a lot of volatility in the market, carriers coming and going, we're holding our own and we're doing okay. And we know going forward that we're starting to plateau, that there are going to be more challenges as we progress. And that's really what I want to update you on today. Thanks to uh, Kristen and Aston, Aspen Skiing Company, we got an updated on-mountain survey. And what that tells us is that we're not meeting the needs of all potential passengers. There are still people who are using alternate airports like Denver, for the most part, a little bit to Vail. But the majority of people are still flying into Aspen of those people that are flying. But what it tells us is there still are some potential upside and some work to do as we move forward. So taking a look at some of our options, just kind of going carrier by carrier, just so you know, United has been a great airline for Aspen. It provides the bulk of your service. They've been here. They've invested heavily after the merger with Continental. They added the Houston service. Uh, they have hubs, one of the best networks of any airline in the world. Hubs in Chicago, Denver, Houston, LA, Newark. But we pick most of the low-hanging fruit with them. As far as United goes, we're likely to see schedule tweaks. Um, there's one destination. They have a large hub in uh, Newark, which is uh, an alternative to New York, JFK, or LaGuardia. But the stage length of that, the distance is too long for the current aircraft that are flying today, and so it's, it's not on our short list. So in regards to United, it's a sense of maintaining and potentially tweaking schedules. And I believe I was talking um, to to build prior to this meeting that United, in terms of tweaking their schedules, extended this year's season into September a little bit, whereas in the past it's been cut off like towards the end of August. So they continue to work with us. American, as you know, uh, came into the market. A lot has changed with American because of their filing with bankruptcy. They've had some new uh, regional service providers. We tend to stay on top of that. We have an office in Dallas, a former American planner, which is going to help us through this transition because right now the people who are making the decisions, the people we talked to that decided to come into Aspen and make that investment are the people that may not be making those decisions going forward. So we're going to stay on top of that for the next, you know, 6 to 12 months because of the merger with U.S. Airways. Um, they also have a pretty strong network, and when they combine with U.S. Airways, they are going to be the world's largest airline. So what we're looking at with American is in the short term, Due to the merger, they're not likely to add any new destinations or do much to the schedule. We're trying to pitch a, a second Dallas-Fort Worth flight, for example, maybe seasonal Chicago. But they're starting to go into that time period, which is not unusual when they're bringing two large companies together, that everything just kind of goes on hold for the next you know, 12 to 18, 18 months. Talked about the merger with U.S. Airways. They've been pretty quiet over the past few years. You know, They pulled out of here. Uh, from their Phoenix flying in 2008, but with the merger with U.S. Airways, we're staying on top of that in terms of revisiting, does Phoenix make sense if it's one of those hubs that remains? Typically in these large mergers, there are winners and losers, and sometimes hubs go away, some get built up, but uh, certainly if Phoenix is around, we're going to continue to dialogue with the new decision makers about that opportunity as well. Delta had come in, as you know, and pulled out in 2010. Uh, they've really been at the forefront of, of getting rid of some of these smaller regional jets and moving towards the larger regional trend that I talked about. These are aircraft like the CRJ 700 and, and above that serve Aspen. Um, and so we continue to dialogue with them about reinstatement of either Atlanta service, Salt Lake, or possibly Minneapolis. That's kind of our low-hanging fruit. And if there was any one carrier I would identify that has the most bang for the buck, it, it would be Delta. And so we continue that dialogue just like with the other airlines on what that possibility is. 
Alaska is another one. Um, they operate hubs mainly out of Seattle and Portland. And again, uh, Seattle is one year top 25 destinations, and so there might be a fit there. And they actually have aircraft, the CRJ 700, like SkyWest, that can serve Aspen. So we're dialoguing with them as well. But uh, the details of the report of the studies that Jim talked about in, in the beginning have a lot of the detail on fleet compatibility, airline detail. There's a lot in there that I'm not covering today due to the time constraint, but just want to highlight some of those that are kind of on our priority list. And so this next page just summarizes. I talked about Alaska and the possibility for Seattle, American tweaking the schedule. Uh, Delta, what the high priorities are there, um, United, U.S. Airways, and uh, even though I didn't spend any time on Great Lakes because they fly turboprop aircraft, we have had them on the radar screen to talk about, you know, extra competition to Denver. But that table on the, on the right, that column on the right, these are the airlines with the details in that report that don't fit. We looked at every potential airline to say, is there compatibility with serving Aspen? So growth carriers, which are like JetBlue, Spirit, Virgin America, Allegiant, these are carriers that don't have aircraft that are capable, certified to fly in Aspen. They're usually larger mainline type aircraft and so they're just not a fit with us. So this particular slide looks at the CRJ 700 in particular and the Q400 which was flown in here before by uh, Frontier are the only two uh, commercial aircraft that are certified for use at Aspen. As we look throughout that list, what we know is that there are new aircraft types coming down the pipeline. For example, the Mitsubishi regional jet, the MRJ, uh, the Bombardier C-Series. These are things that we're looking at. We're keeping our eye on the ball because we know that the industry is changing and some of the specifications to these aircraft are changing as well. And so. We saw the volatility of that one slide carriers coming in and out, and as we look over the next five to ten years, what we know is that the industry continues to evolve. As Jim said in the beginning, it's a very dynamic industry. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Slide? Um, thank you. Under the future regional jets, um, some do, as you've pointed out, exceed our wing wingspan limitation. Is that with the winglets, or is that just a flat wing? It, it, it depends on the manufacturer, really, and, and even the Bombardier C-Series hasn't come off the production line yet, and so it's just a, a prototype, and the MRJ hasn't reached U.S. market yet. I think 2015 is the launch customer, I think, for the MRJ, but it could be a bit mixed. Like the MRJ, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, I don't think has the winglets. All the all the future aircraft have winglets coming online. So. If, if, Rachel, your question is the base wing versus what the winglets are doing, mm -hmm. you know, I think I think we're all um, gaining understanding that the winglets are growing in size and dimensions, and so um, all the future aircraft I'm aware of have winglets, substantial winglets added to the end of the base wing. And maybe just to take a minute, but why are winglets becoming part of this dynamic of the new planes? You know, it's really about efficiency. Right. Um, those uh, those winglets, depending upon what <clears throat> manufacturer you talk to, um, add about six percent better fuel economy um, by having those winglets in place versus not. And subsequently, there's a reduction in greenhouse gases and the amount of thrust needed to keep the airplane in the air. So that has a noise reduction component to it. So. Um, you know, the technology and the use of composite materials and other things have really kind of changed how aircraft manufacturers look at aircraft wing design. Um, I suspect over the next few years, as airplanes go to more composite materials, we may even see entire wings like, like are currently showing up in very large airplanes like the, C or, or the 787 may start to show up in some of these smaller regional jets that are our target market. Um, and, the, and what happens with that is, is pretty fascinating, I think, when you talk to manufacturers. You know, aerodynamicists could, could design a wing with very high efficiency for the longest time, but they take it down to the shop floor and, that, and the manufacturing folks on the floor would go, I, I can't build that out of aluminum, that's just not possible with composite materials and the way that, that manufacturing techniques are shifting, 
they'll be able to design every inch of the wing for maximum efficiency. So there's a, a very much a change going on in aircraft aerodynamics and aircraft design. And, and, and the big pusher of that, as you might imagine, comes around to the price of fuel and the cost of transporting uh, the airplane across country. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I was going to say the popularity of those took off uh, really post-2008 when we were going into the recession and we saw the big spike in fuel costs. That's when you start to see the carriers going back, looking at their larger mainline aircraft that Jim was talking about, saying, should we in invest in this? Because it does add efficiency. And then as Jim was talking about, the manufacturers, the next generation, if you will, these future, they're all going to have that going forward just because it does add that fuel efficiency. Come to, what, to this to the same to this to this chart. To yeah. This chart. Um, Sorry. No, the fine. the Q four hundred is that the the turbo prop that Frontier was flying? Correct. I, think I just want to make sure I knew. And it says that the the CRJ seven hundred and the Q four hundred are the only two commonly flown regional planes mm -hmm. that are allowed to come into Aspen. Why is it that these other planes are not the, the CRJ-1000, the CRJ-900. I mean, it looks like they're within our wingspan. Is it a weight issue? Is it a, um, what's, what's the issue on these other planes? Um, it, it's really about the performance of the aircraft. Um, you know, here we've got issues related to both elevation and temperature. And so, depending upon the, the the thrust or the horsepower of that particular airplane versus, you know, climbing in and out of this valley. Um, it doesn't mean those airplanes could not fly here, but no one's gone to the challenge of trying to get it certified because on first blush, it really doesn't look like it has the performance capabilities to, to operate here. And, and just a quick understanding in terms of the CRJ 700, 900, 1000, is the 900 replacing the 700 and is the 1000 replacing the 900 or are they just used in different mark and different uh, types of airports it's is it a newer model or is it or is it they're both continuously being made they're all continuously being made um, it's just a matter of kind of a size criteria um, and they fit those airplanes in where they think they get the best efficiency for use of the aircraft you know, in our case, the CR700 has really quite exceptional power to weight ratio, which allows it to operate well here. But it was still a very time consuming endeavor to get that airplane certified. We put together weather data hour over hour for five years and shared it with SkyWest as they ran the modeling. In addition, and I think um, perhaps Joseph was going to hit on it in a moment, is that that, for example, the range and such of those airplanes, every aircraft, or excuse me, aircraft, every airline has their own parameters about how they operate that aircraft. So one airline may feel comfortable doing this because they put the research and effort into maintaining safety and feel good about it, while another airline may just decide that's not what they're looking to do. We've had, and kind of a follow-up to your point, we've had conversations with the manufacturer of the E-Series aircraft, the 170, 175, and such up there, and they continue to be optimistic that those airplanes could operate here, but we haven't found an, an airline who's willing to do that investment and look at, mm -hmm. at that aircraft for our market. It's a really good point. It varies airline to airline, as Jim said, and, and the E-Series is a great example. Back when um, Northwest, prior to the, the Delta merger, had uh, bought the E-175 um, for their regional provider, we'd run some numbers on that. And on surface, it looked like it, there was a fit, but when it got down to the operational level of the airline, based on their internal criteria, they said, eh, we can't, we can't, we're not comfortable doing it without some restrictions. And so that's why I say we have to keep our eye on the ball on these things, because the technology is changing, uh, to Jim's point. It's not that some of these couldn't fly, it's just we haven't found an airline that's capable of doing that yet. So you're right, Rob, the only certified today are the Q400 and the CRJ700. And just a quick note, if I might, George, the other piece of the puzzle is that to complicate things, sometimes the air, airlines order different engines for the same uh, fuselage. So when you buy a car, you may get the four-cylinder, you may get the eight-cylinder high output. The same can be said for some of these airplanes. So uh, when you go to look at performance numbers like Northwest did in the uh, 175 series, 
um, there may be another engine that gives them better performance capabilities for our high and hot location. But that particular airline may not have ordered that engine, which was the case with the, the 175. It comes down to that, as Jim said, the, the power weight ratio. And each aircraft is different, and each airline is different. So a lot of complexity there, which is why we have to keep our eye on the ball and stay on top of it as we move forward. Thank you. So just talking about a few minutes about next steps. So we know there's a changing landscape. I talked about the shortage of you know aircraft, available aircraft for Aspen, certainly, and um, fewer airlines to talk to, and that the specifications on these equipment types are changing. And we know that the airline investment is significant. For somebody to come in like American did and start up their new service here, it's a multi-million dollar investment. So they do put a, a lot of skin in the game, if you will. And we know that the rules of the game have changed. If you look throughout the industry and you follow it like I do, as I talked about in the beginning, communities have gotten very aggressive with their air service development efforts. And so when we have those conversations, we're hearing more and more about those community partnerships, sort of like we did with American. That, that is a great example. In fact, uh, we had the American Airlines speaker at our Air Service Development Conference early this year, and he talked about that great partnership with Aspen. So you should all be proud of your Air Service Development Task Force that made that happen. Go ahead. Oh. I was going to ask, what, what do you mean by very aggressive? Are they offering more subsidies, more guarantees? Or? It, it's a little mix of everything, and it, it depends market by market. You know, each, each market has what I'll call their kind of identified, you know, risk factors. How, how much investment is it going to take to come in there based on, you know, how far it is to fly, how much investment they have versus what the potential upside is. So there are communities across the country as we've seen consolidation and fewer airlines and fewer aircraft that have gotten very aggressive. Some of it is, is direct subsidies. Um, the, the largest, uh, most egregious example I can think of is there was a, a private investor in Florida, a small airport down there that uh, put up over $20 million to try to recruit someone like Southwest Airlines, for example. Now that's an extreme example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very extreme, but it is an eye-opener when you go, really? That's what it takes to get Southwest Airlines in, in this environment? The good news about that is that Southwest came in. They were highly risk-averse, I'll call it, going into this market because it's relatively small. It was untested for this business model, um, but they returned the revenue guarantee unused. And so that subsidy, they didn't even tap into it at all because you know, the numbers worked out, the, the economics. There, there are other examples of communities that, you know, put up in the range of, you know, a million dollars. American used to throw around the number uh, prior to us getting this deal done that smaller markets that, you know, rule of thumb would be like two million dollars is what we're looking for. So it varies market by market. If you do your homework, and you present a strong business case um, like we did with American, you can usually get away with something that uh, maybe is more palatable for both the community and the airline. Thank you. So in the short and medium term, we're continuing to work on those top um, priorities that I talked about before when I went through the details of who's a likely candidate, who is it? And so we continue to talk to the airlines that make sense for us on, on behalf of the community. Uh, longer term, though, we need to keep our eye on the ball. We talked about the, the changing industry, and we already saw how you know there's been a lot of change in this market just over the last five years. And when we look out over the next five to ten years, we know that the, the new aircraft coming down the pipeline, as Jim talked about, are going to be having composite materials, and there's going to be, you know, different influencing factors whether or not those aircraft are capable to serve this market. But because we only have two that are certified today, we really need to stay on top of that. I mean, who would have known 10 years ago that someone like a Brazilian aircraft manufacturer like Embraer was going to be, you know, one of the, the world's third largest aircraft manufacturer? Who's to say 10 years from now it's not coming from India, Russia, or China? And so that's what we want to do is keep our eye on the ball so that we continue to have, you know, the sustainability and the viability going forward so that we're not shut out of the market. So now I'll just open it up for questions and dialogue. Good, thank you. I'll make just a couple of observations and a uh, suggestion. Um, the, uh, what we're really missing, I think, is um, for air service coming in is the New York market in terms of the nonstop. And that's due to, as you suggest, in terms of the, uh, the size of the air carrier where that, that's a very successful market for Eagle. And in fact, when I used to sell wholesale air, 
I would fly a lot of my clients into Eagle on that nonstop, and they would come to Aspen. They really liked that nonstop. Sure. The, um, and, and, and then when you looked at the chart uh, in terms of people coming into Aspen versus flying to Denver and mm -hmm. Eagle, uh, I suspect some of that is due to uh, capacity issues. So certain times of the year, Christmas week, President's week, mm -hmm. the seats are sold out That's into exactly Aspen, right. so, so clients have to look at other alternative airports. And Denver is usually the easiest one, uh, certainly during Christmas week, to try to find any open space. The, um, and the other thing I thought I found was interesting is that we are still, as this chart shows, staying very, very competitive amongst our, our, our other ski destination resorts, and especially in light of Vail and Steamboat that uh, do guaranteed seats and subsidize those, and, and we've never done that. Uh, so that speaks well in terms of the strength of uh, the Aspen Snowmass market and, and the, um, uh, the uh, continuing uh, ongoing interest in terms of repeat guests. But it seems like the challenge, the challenge is for us to try to uh, determine where we're going to go in the future given the new technology, uh, the uh, commitment by the airlines in terms of what they're looking at in terms of developing. Uh, the new uh, planes. So it seems like we really need to, uh, we need to generate a study uh, to determine what, what the options are for us at, at the Aspen Pickett County Airport to address uh, the, these new technologies, not only to maintain our current seats, but to remain competitive in the, in the coming years. So that seems to be the next direction that, that I think we need to go uh, to look at. Yeah, I, I would concur. Like I said, we need to keep our eye on the ball because it's it's continually evolving. And, and you're right, we have done well relative to peers, but I can tell you that only happens because of the activism of your air service development group that you have and the persistence and staying on top of that and, and dealing with these complexities. John? And George, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I was going to bring up, I, I did my own uh, little Google search uh, when we were getting ready for this. and. You know, you can see SkyWest, which is our major carrier, is on Wikipedia as already having ordered a hundred of these uh, Mitsubishi regional jets, um, which right now don't fit within that wingspan issue. And as you know, our airport's operating under uh, modification to standard uh, already to have us at 95, uh, a 95 foot wingspan. And so I, I think this idea of a study um, is particularly important as we're considering, you know, whether there's going to be future development at the airport or not, and you know, how would the FAA uh, be be looking at um, the, these future jets that might be serving us? And it's a long, longer-term issue, but um, we may be faced with with questions of our physical layout mm -hmm. um, before all those jets even come online. And so now is a good time for us to really make sure that we're doing that due diligence and you know I'd suggest that um, what we do is come back with a suggested uh, scope of a study um, that would again look at what can we find out about the future you know, air service and, and what the feasible uh, feasibility is of different airplanes coming in uh, to our airport and having a better understanding of what that might mean uh, for the physical layout of our airport as, as the FAA is you know, right now considering uh, our, our airport layout plan. I, I think it would be good to try and get ahead of that curve. Uh, questions? Board questions? Rachel? Uh, I guess, oh, did, go ahead, no, Steve. go ahead. I was just going to say, um, I would support moving that sort of effort forward. <clears throat> I think that that's important. I, I think that concurrently or, or in, embodied within that have to be uh, the goals and the standards that the community had set with the the um, uh, wingspan restriction. And we also still have, of course, the weight restrictions, mm -hmm. uh, which other airlines, airports have. But, you know, the priorities were on uh, noise abatement, no noise issues, um, the concerns of you know, quote, industrial tourism, um, you know, I don't think we're talking uh, uh, about uh, airlines that are doubling their seat capacity or things like that, 
but uh, those were the issues. Safety, of course, naturally with a challenging airport. And so whatever we were crafting mm -hmm. our original uh, restrictions around, we need to make sure that any of those goals and those objectives are still uh, matched up within this, that, you know, will this continue to follow? Because, I mean, I look at it and I think to myself, boy, I really have a great cassette collection. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't been able to buy a car with a cassette player for <laughs> quite a while. And, and uh, you know, you just don't want to end up m mismatched at the end of the day. Exactly. Absolutely. Steve and Rob and Michael. Um, I'm wondering how many nautical miles it is from Aspen to potential new destinations like Seattle or or Newark or things like that. Yeah, Newark's beyond the legs of the 700. It's too far. It physically can't make it. But you're right, George, that would be a great market. If we had a, a, an aircraft that came online, let's say the Mitsubishi in the next five years, and, being flown by SkyWest, as John was pointing out, it had the legs to get there. And again, you have to, you know, look at all the details of the operator. Um, that's one that certainly would be high priority. Something like Atlanta, for example, which is, I think, just about um, 900 plus miles, is is beyond the edge of what the 700 can do today. That aircraft actually takes restrictions about seven seats, I think. So even today, once you get into some of those longer distance, Seattle, I think, would be okay on the 700, but anything kind of beyond that, that range gets more challenging. Joseph, can you pick up or recall from memory the distance to Seattle, the air miles to Seattle or, or New York? Does anybody? Uh, New York, I think, is like 1,700. It's, real, it's really far. Seattle's in range of the 700. It's below 1,000, shorter than Atlanta is, for example. I think it's like in the 700, 800 range. So when the if you're doing in that longer destination, would you have to load more fuel on, and then would the planes be pushing the weight limit for? Yes, you definitely have to take on more fuel. The amount of passengers or cargo. Yes, but what we don't know is what the future operating characteristics of something like the Mitsubishi that's going to be coming online in the next five years will be like. Will it have the legs to do Atlanta, Newark, unrestricted? We don't know that yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are our different options for, I mean, it looks like the handwriting's on the wall to me that the planes are going to be coming in with wider wingspans that don't meet our 95-foot restriction. What can we do for, at our airport to make, to allow for a larger than 95-foot wingspan? Well, well, again, I think that goes back to the need to do yeah. a more comprehensive study. I think I think that's what we're not prepared to answer, only because we we still need to really explore um, the regulatory environment and how the FAA would view any modification or a modification uh, of standards. Mm -hmm. And then um, we we also haven't really done any of the work of if. if once we understand that better, then I think we understand what the physical characteristics might need to be uh, of the airport, and we could, then it becomes an engineering question. But I, I think that's why uh, it's a good idea for us to do further study, because we have designed really around this 95-foot modification to standard at this point. Rob? In regards specifically to American Airlines, um, our newest uh, carrier, have we or have they presented us with an assessment of success for their first season here? And this it has, because that would provide information in terms of how to get them to boost their their operations here in the sense that. You know, I mean, I could fly American to go to Europe, but instead, because United flies here and I want to fly out of here, I'm not, they're not getting that extra leg. So that's a big, big thing. It's not just the dollars for the flight from here to their hub in Dallas. It's getting a customer onto American to fly from Dallas to wherever they're flying to. Um, but I think one of the, the big key measures uh, or big boosters of success that we could have in the near future is really getting American to be year-round as opposed to just winter season, um, which cr creates uh, difficulty. And I flew 
back on American a year, about a year ago now, and I had to sleep in Dallas because the flight couldn't get into Dallas early enough to get that one flight that was coming back here. Um, you know, so to me, I think that's one of the huge things that we should be working on and, and investing in, however we invest in it, whether it be a study or finessing or whatever. <laughs> so the question is, is there, has there been any analysis done on what the level of success specifically for Americans' operations, and how do we use that information to increase their operations here in this market? Well, I think you bring a, a really great point uh, forward, Rob. I think that American was was poised. As soon as they could find airplanes, they were looking to add additional capacity into our community. So that was great news. So to answer your question about success, the best way to measure success is when they start to think about adding additional service. So I think we passed that test, and we've heard rumors that we were one of the top uh, new launch destinations they've had in recent memory and things like that. Um, unfortunately, the timing isn't working great for us because they're going into this merger moment with U.S. Airways. And so where we thought they would be bringing on a, a new sizable number of regional jets into their inventory, which has really been the bottleneck in their, um, their business planning side, and now they're going through this merger with U.S. Airways. And as Joseph mentioned, it is typical for an airline to go internal for a period of time while they sort through things. The pieces, as I see it, are strategic for us, is, is to maintain a high level of communication and relationship with the new players that are part of this new merged airline. Because they're going to take two planning staff, two scheduling staffs, they're all going to get kind of mushed together, and there'll be a few folks that will be unemployed at the end of that discussion, is to stay in front of them and keep them advised about what we're up to and what the options and opportunities exist. And that's kind of what our play has to be here for a little window of time. And as soon as they get those airplanes and they got their world kind of settled in a little bit, that's when we'll really have a chance to get those additional flights, the additional capacity that we're looking so, for. So I guess what I'm alluding to is doing the analysis of what it's worth to them so that we have it prepared for the negotiations. Um, and we can do that based on passenger numbers, flight distance, the cost of fuel for that particular you know, thing. I mean, there's all I'm, more stuff than I know. I mean, here's another big one. Everybody I know in Aspen has got this card in their pocket. I mean, everybody. A United credit card, and they're using it to get miles so that they can fly in and out of here. It's my go-to card, <laughs> and that's what they're that's what they're using it for. An American wants these customers, these you know people that travel here and live here and have second homes here, using that card. So any ammunition that we can start gathering now, why wait until this merger finishes to start doing that? Is what I'm suggesting. Well, and, and thank you for clarifying the question. I'm sorry I missed it on the first uh, go around, Rob. I, I can tell you that we keep track of that kind of data. That's one of the things that, that Joseph does on an ongoing basis. So we have good talking points uh, along the way. When we're getting set to push for a new flight, when it gets close to that date, we'll do even some additional details because their flight schedules may change. The connectability of those international travelers is a big deal. Um, you know, the Brazil uh, connection has proven to be very valuable to American over to Dallas-Fort Worth, and they've noticed that. Uh, we're seeing a lot of Aussies over um, Los Angeles as an example. So um, I, I want to give you some comfort that we're, we're not napping while they're doing their thing. We, we're constantly trying to rework the numbers, look at options, see who's buying airplanes, some of that stuff. But I think what may be talked about here is starting to kind of gather that into a common document plus some additional scope. And just to reiterate what Jim said, we, we are staying on top of that, Rob, and, and staying in touch with the, the personnel transition already, even before the merger. 
people have changed, as I mentioned, the people we talked to about bringing an American in here, not the people that are American now, and those probably won't be the people, you know, six, six months from now. Uh, there is a lag in the industry data in terms of us getting what American reports. What they've done is we've talked to them, they've reported to us kind of how their season went and said, hey, you know, these things are looking good. I view it as they kind of tipped their toe in the water when they came into Aspen with the schedule that they had, right? And as Jim said, we've passed that initial test, so the next likely scenario would be for them to ramp up additional capacity, but because of this merger and the shortage of aircraft, that's it's, it's not that we aren't staying in touch with them and pitching that idea, it's just they've told us that you know, we're not even taking meetings right now. The, the word from them two weeks ago is, don't bother come to our office. We're just so slammed with this merger right now. But we, we stay in touch with them. As soon as the industry data is available, we'll be talking about that with them as well and talking about the timing of when do you think, you know, something else might happen here. Michael? Yeah, in terms of the study, uh, we need to discuss what the, what, what the boundaries are because I think Rachel alluded to a lot of things, but I'd rather have just a, a, a glimpse of what the airlines are planning. And then, <clears throat> given that scenario, discussing what our FAA obligations are, what our restrictions are, not merging the two studies. I'd like to have a clear picture of what the possibilities of airline travel are in the future going out whatever length of time. Then discussing what those implications are for the community. In, but not mixing the two preliminarily. I, I can see it being multi-phase, Michael, <clears throat> and being able to focus it more here and then move to the next phase and the next phase. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine with me. You know, what I, what I would suggest is maybe following up on this meeting, since this was a general overview, is that we come back um, with a, a recommendation how to proceed um, with the study, and then we can uh, work out the scope with the board to make sure we're answering um, the right questions in the right order and the right timing uh, from from your perspective. So we'll get that um, on a work session as soon as possible. I think we have some ideas um, and you're going to have some ideas so we should probably spend a little bit of time making sure all those are aligned. And uh, so we'll come back maybe in a couple weeks here and, and uh, have that discussion. Rachel? Uh, yeah, uh, two other things, um, moving on to other related topics, uh, and knowing that maybe we don't have time to answer them today, but uh, the next time we really uh, talk about this, I want to know what impact we feel the um, ever-increasing baggage fees is going to have on an uh, industry like ski tourism, where it's very hard to travel light. And, you know, now some of the airlines are even charging for carry-on uh, yeah. and things like that. And I've read that that's going to be a continuing trend. Um, but I, I think we should have some sense of that. And are there, are there other alternatives we should be suggesting to people as they make their reservation? Is it, is it uh, less expensive to FedEx uh, or UPS slow ground, you know, two of your packages? and still save the family X amount of money on baggage fees or, you know, how do we deal with the baggage? You know, we obviously don't control it. The airlines are going to do what they'd like, but I'd love to understand the impact and are there um, any sort of mitigations or, or other customer service oriented programs that we can implement that might help um, with the total sticker shock of doing that. And then uh, the other thing I was a little interested in when I looked at the charts you presented, uh, was how is the Grand Junction Airport doing and are they or will they be a, a connection to us? It, it's just interesting. I, w I was out there uh, just yesterday and you can see a lot of new development and a lot of improvements that they've been making there. I understand their air, air service um, levels have been going up and I just, you know, it's not not that much further than Eagle Vale if people are, are looking to an alternative uh, way into Aspen. And so I just kind of wanted to understand what our relationship with that airport might be in the future. Okay, any other last minute questions? John? Yeah, George, I might just make one last comment in a few minutes, and it's kind of building on um, the comments that Rob made around American Airlines. Um, because it, I think it's important to have that information at the table. 
One of the things we've also struggled with a little bit is as a community being aligned with responding quickly when there is an opportunity. For example, when, when American came in, we were trying to herd a lot of cats right in the uh, um, midst of, of trying to work with the airline. And so um, I just note for the board that at the staff level, we've been participating in an informal group that's, um, you know, a, consist of the some staff from the municipalities and stay up and snow mass and uh, the the ski company to see if there's a better way when those opportunities come in front of us for us to be uh, ready to respond to them and so we don't have any conclusions yet about what that looks like um, but that might be the other side of the equation Rob to what you're talking about is understanding what that business case is and then being able to respond to it fairly quickly within, you know, some level of discretion that all the entities and all the, um, you know, boards and such have, have agreed to. So that's another discussion that we'll have to have in the future. It's not um, developed or ripe yet, but just wanted you to know we are working on that side of the equation too. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Thank you very for much for your up. time today. Thank, thank, you thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, I'm you Perfect. Talk right back up. Perfect. Back on schedule. <laughs> we cut your shorts. We're back on schedule. <laughs> FYI, I may be interested in that um, you know our per completion percentage of flights on reliability is reliability has always been such an issue for us at our airport, and the fact is that we had a 96 percent uh, reliability in March, which um, borders on near perfect and comparable to almost any airport you can think of. So um, things have come come a good distance. Yes. Yes. That's a good point. It's Jim, don't unusual. forget your cool beer. And your jacket. We have a lost in the pound. <laughs> <laughs> I probably got 10 of them in there. <laughs> Okay, next is we have a citizen board interview. Ellen Hunt is here, and she is applying for the citizen grant review. So welcome, Ellen. Thanks. Thank you for applying. And Ellen, the format we use is we'll just go around and ask you uh, uh, some questions just to get to know you a little bit better and your interest, and we'll go from there. Good. So anybody would like to start? Alan, you have spent a lot of time on different boards, <laughs> and I'm sure the different groups have really appreciated your efforts there. Um, your things have been, tended to be around art, arts kind of things more than like the Anderson Ranch and the Council for the Arts and different things like that. Um, on this position, you'd be looking at a wide variety of applications from different nonprofit groups. So, um, how how do you how would you analyze uh, like compare the different applications? I would hope that I would take them one on you know one at a time. And are we talking about health and human services and things like that? Yeah, great. I've just I've just been doing what I did because that's. How it's, how it's been, it's probably my background is much more of an art person, but I don't think it's it would be an issue. So you think you would be fair not give arts groups oh. more uh, prior, priority or a preference? So I would, I would hope not. I would certainly hope not, especially since I'm, I'm a volunteer now in the food pantry, and if you were to ask me where I think funds should go right now, that's where I would be putting them. So no, I don't think that would be a problem. Okay. You were on the Ag Committee too, didn't you see? Yeah, no, it's good to see you again. That's that was good. a whole different Very different. era ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Rachel? 
Yeah, and I don't think you'll be put in much of a conflict per se because our Healthy Community Fund really doesn't do granting to arts foundations or arts groups per se, uh, similar to if with the city. If it did, does. I would have to okay. say I can't vote on if it were Film Fest or something. I'd have to recuse yeah. myself. But, but we we do not take applications for those groups. It's really much more limited than uh, as a pot to the original ballot language. Uh, although some of the groups may have some art type of function, you know, teaching kids about the rivers, may ask them to do art on that, but it's not their primary goal. Um, what I was going to ask is you do have a very extensive resume, and do you feel that some of your experience on those boards will help you analyze the viability of these other organizations and their spreadsheets and so on as they come in for their requests. I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> and how long have you been involved with the food pantry? Since, <coughs> since it started, Linda and I and a, couple, and a few others started it. Okay. Yeah. You so know, I know I've seen you down there. Well, you certainly times. have, and you've been very generous, Rachel. Thank you. It's, it's been great, and it's probably been the most satisfying sad as it is that we have a food pantry, it's probably been the most satisfying job I've had. It's just an astonishing. I urge all of you, if you're looking for something to do on a Tuesday or Thursday, to come down there. It's an amazing, amazing thing. You know, we keep hoping we're going to be go out of business, but not yet. Bob? No, oh, thank you for all that you do in the community, and thank you for applying. Um, my question is, because you've got so much board experience, when you're on a board, what role do you find yourself in? Are you a listener? Are you a talker? Are you a fighter for what you want? Are you a gather all the information and reason with a comprehensive decision in the end? Well, gosh, Rob, <laughs> that's a good question. I have to think about that. I, um, well, I've, I've been in a, a leadership position in a lot of the boards on which I've served, and I've also worked my way up. Anderson Ranch, I just started out on the board, and then I moved up and up and up and up. And certainly with the um, city-appointed Wheeler Arts Board, it was the same situation. But then when I really want to do something, yes, I do fight for it. Yeah. If it touches me and I feel passionate about it, yes. Thanks for applying. <laughs> Rachel? Yeah, the, uh, this board is, I'd say, um, one of the most interesting in that they have an incredible bulk of work to do in a short time. And so the meetings are very intense. It's almost a, a week long worth of meetings. Not more. I mean, I'm sure the board itself will meet to talk about the process and agree on mutual dates. But it is at that one point reviewing an awful lot of grant applications and a lot of dialogue among the members uh, about the grants. When is that? Uh, is it August? Um, yeah, the. the I, I don't have the specific schedule, but it is uh, typically the grants are going out now, and they'll typically be reviewed in August, so that they're August and September really, so that they're ready yeah, for. And it's about the board a week or ten all. day long process yeah. th that they do their work and then they're done essentially well, for the year. I, I did say to Mitzi that that this year would be fine, but next year I, I I couldn't do it. But then I'm wide open. But I know I'm going to be away next year, probably from the middle of August till around the 10th of September. If it were before that, it's no problem. Okay. And, but this year is, is not a problem. You're available in that time period for yes. the, to make that time commitment. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Ellen, I, I noticed that you at one point served, you were a city-appointed agricultural committee. Yeah. Why does the city have an ag committee? Well, Ask Steve here about that ad committee. Oh, I think well, I'm maybe asking you. I'm asking you. <laughs> well, maybe county. It was it was county probably, it was county, but it no. was very complicated. We were trying. It was all a conversation about TDRs and about ag use, and it went out how long? Six years maybe? How long were we doing that? Um, and it. W I own some land up North Thompson Creek, which is why I got involved which is why I'm fighting so hard to prevent drilling right now, in case any of you have full disclosure here. I'm working really hard to try to keep the drilling away from the Thompson Divide. And um, that's how I got involved in the Ag Committee, because I'm a landowner. Okay. 
The, the other question I have is, and you, you mentioned this earlier, that, that you're, you're a strong supporter of the food pantry, which, which is great. But I also see that you serve your founding member of the Baguettes, which is the Aspen branch of Lift Up. That's so, the food pantry. That's, that's a, yeah. That's so it goes food. back to sort of the, um, uh, the question of having to recuse yourself at certain parts of certain applications or grants. If, if, if Lift Up is applying, I would probably say I shouldn't vote on that because I am personally involved. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I mean, is there somebody, that, I'm not the only person making this decision, am I? Or no, it's part of a larger review committee. Right. And so I, others may have associations which require them to step away from the table as well. So I could recuse myself and it wouldn't damage anything or get in the way. There are five representatives uh, on the grant review committee uh, with at least one youth representative. And the committee's responsibility is to make recommendations to the Board of Commissioners on how to appropriate those funds. But, well, I mean, I'd be kind of upfront about it. Okay, well, thank you very much for applying, and um, we'll try to get back to you in a uh, short period of time. Great, thank you. Good. Rob, I didn't know you were on the council. It's great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Good to see you. Okay, let's see. What do we have next? We've got we've got a break. Oh, we <laughs> Perfect. Grassroots will we'll take a what do we need? Ten or fifteen minute break? Fifteen minute break? Yeah. Okay, and then, we, then we can press through and so back at uh, 225. Great, right, folks. No.
Okay, next on the agenda are our memos of interest. And John, you want to introduce these? Yeah, our first one is an update on the Galena Plaza um, planning process. We've been in front of you a, a couple times on this, and I think we have a final approved plan that Jody's going to talk about. So I have Jody here to present this. Thank you, Jody, facilities manager. And again, we were here in March and we presented a, a Galena Plaza. Um, their design and how it impacted our parking on the west side of the courthouse and law enforcement and uh, part of that uh, you can see we have that up on the screen behind you where um, that parking circle uh, would have been impacted um, with police vehicles and um, so we we presented that to you and um, the plan was this plan here whoops There it is. We actually came to you um, with the city. We had looked at our options and we, we decided we had made a recommendation of having a bunch of vehicles. You can see them in red there um, out in front of the courthouse to open the main street up and put parking in front of the courthouse and the courthouse plaza. And then to do some angled parking along North Galena um, on the west side of the courthouse and then along the Galena Plaza parking uh, near closer to the air, uh, the library, and um, boards, the board of county commissioners gave us feedback that they really didn't want us putting any kind of parking on Main Street in front of the uh, the courthouse. So we went back and we shared that information with city council, and they were in alignment with the board of county commissioners, and so we came back and. Um, the city staff assets team came up with this plan where they were able to put all of the vehicles at angled parking uh, on the north side of the Galena and in front of the or along the alleyway uh, Mill Street Alley and we can put all of the vehicles that were pretty much needed uh, from a sheriff and police perspective on that uh, area so the Council, we also have the 44 foot easement for the library planned into that. Uh, so they're still working and honoring that. You can see an outline around um, the parking structures roof on the, um, on the Rio Grande side of that street. Sorry, I can't get this pointer to work up in here. <laughs> um, so they're um, still planning that for the future but what the city council has approved and directed the city assets team was to move forward with this plan of building that green space um, they are building green space around the the library easement but they won't be building onto it or putting big trees or anything that we'd have to relocate at another time and then the bike path or walking path around there so it's not going to be much different than what it is now uh, but they'll get to their goal of replacing that roof for the parking structure to save the integrity of the parking garage um, the police and sheriff get the parking that they are needing and we were able to honor the request to not put any parking on main street in front of the courthouse and so the city council has directed them to move forward with hundred percent of their design and my goal today was just to give you guys an update give you some follow-through on um, what the city has has been doing so Jody will, will that new parking uh, scenario affect or impact the uh, crosstown shuttle at all um John do you want to answer that uh, John Latch uh, the asset manager for the city of Aspen uh, the parking will particularly impact the uh, shuttle but the one-way direction of mill uh, in on mill uh, through the alley and out on Main Street will so change the circulation slightly for the shuttle in and out. So, so I'm a little confused. So how will that go then? They'll come in uh, off a mill and go out on Main Street. Oh, I see. Versus, versus, versus going in and out on mill. Rather than well, they go. They come in off a of mill now. Uh, but they also come in from the uh, 
uh, gondola, uh, they come in from Main Street as well because it's too too directional. So the gate will be one way. But when they go when they're going out on Main Street, there's there's no traffic light there where there, where there is on Mill. Line. So won't that be a problem for the Crosstown shuttle heading back up towards the gondola? No, the traffic lights will remain. They'll just get reprogrammed. There are traffic lights there. There are traffic, there are there are traffic, traffic lights. lights now. Oh, I, I was thinking. Uh, There's no traffic lights know. here. Right. They only come so in. They only come in, in there. In on Mill. Oh, okay. Out thank you. On Main Street. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Yeah, just to follow up on that one round. So, if you were at the gondola getting picked up on the shuttle, you would come back uh, to the traffic light, take a left, go down. You know, so you're going to wait two traffic lights on the shuttle to come in the alley and get dropped out, and that's going to double back around there to Hunter Creek. I mean, it's going to be looping a whole block instead of what was looping around the little circle. The direction will cost about two blocks in time. Okay, and and the traffic lights and so we'll, okay. I, no, I was just kind of wondering because I it, I use that quite a bit. But the tourists will still be told that they can come up there and take the shuttle and. And one the of the nice things I think that we're planning on doing is the elevator will be in the same place out of the garage. Mm -hmm. The storage building that blocks and traps the elevator will be removed. So when you come out of the elevator, you will see directly to the uh, the bus. You'll know exactly where to go. You won't get trapped in trying to get out of the elevator with your skis. My people are walking through the tunnel between the elevator and the stairway and trying to pay for the parking at the same time. So that's just kind of a very confusing, very confusing and for uh, guests to the uh, to town that haven't been here before, I think it'll be much simplified. They'll come out of the elevator and the town will be right before them, including the bus. Okay. And one other follow-up question on this. Um, this new greenery that's being created here adjacent to the courthouse yes is that going to be low-lying shrubs or are we going to be consulted because there's been a lot put into the roses and the aesthetics and the view planes of the of the courthouse and is that envisioned as tall cottonwood trees or more of the crab it's, apples it's, at this point it's not envisioned as uh, as anything but a uh, a water quality uh, device to help uh, the runoff that uh, is picked up off of Main Street. Okay. Uh, so it, it will have a lower quality to it than a higher quality. And it will impact the, the crabs that are there, but uh, we've got to make some compromises, and, and that may be the one compromise we make. And that is green space right now. It is green space now. And so that's not extending that further into the um, current roadway to It, come, it comes in possibly maybe a foot, foot and a half. We, we haven't gotten into that detail, but it, it doesn't impact the overall dimensions that are basically out there right now. Thank you. Rob, did you have your hand up? No? Any other questions, Steve? Um, the Shuttle, uh, Galena Street shuttle is going to be unloading people out into the alley instead of onto the pedestrian part there, the way the bus is coming in. Uh, that is correct, uh, with the exception that the alley will no longer be an alley. It will be treated as a pedestrian multimodal uh, facility. So the, the thought of dumping people off on the alley rather than on the mall. Uh, type of uh, environment is, is totally different. Okay. Um, there was a car sitting behind the bank building, and it looks like one of the police cars, which you're showing how the police cars are parked. That is, I presume, not a p parking place for a police car down there, is it? Or no. No. Yeah, that one down there. Yeah. No. Is that just showing a it's random It's just showing car? a random vehicle. It's okay. Yeah, I was like counting police car parking places and I saw that one down there. Well, I will note that the two spots between those two green uh, areas, those are handicapped. No, those are for, uh, for courthouse uh, business, uh, citizens okay. coming in for the their vehicle. Two darker colored cars right. there. Yeah. Those two vehicles. So you have six vehicles uh, parked essentially off of the alley for police. You have six parked on the east side of the west 
uh, portion of the courthouse on North Galena Street, and you have four police vehicles uh, on Main Street. Uh, so you have a total of 16 that are in those uh, those alignments. Okay. Uh, City Council also asked us to change the six off of the alley to be back in as well. So uh, we had an experiment out there, and the police adapted very well to that uh, concept of backing in, slow in, fast out. Okay. Then my other question is over there where it says ACRA study area. On the north side of the plaza, yes. Is that going to be the plaza going to extend over the open air parking spaces in the parking garage, right there? We conceptually have got numerous uh, scenarios to how that might be, and and since we found ourselves in that dilemma of having numerous options, uh, they all were contingent. On what we actually do with the building, so that's why we reserve that area. Uh, but there's a possibility of that building coming up to a level that it would uh, exit right onto the plaza level, but we haven't started any study of that at all. Okay. Michael? Uh, how is uh, the library structure or right away going to be preserved in this plan? Uh, there are only plans to provide access to the existing library um, that would provide for ADA and so uh, safe access until such time the um, uh, expansion is built and the rest of it would go into uh, lawn or wildflower planting so that there would be no encumbrance of major uh, structures or impediments to uh, uh, proceeding with expansion at the time the library uh, so chooses. Uh, and we have, we have committed to uh, working with the library and the county in regards to any structural modifications that they would like to have made before we finish our work. So, so that is in progress? Is that what's, what I'm being told? The structural aspect of the right away for the library is going to be put in place before the, this is covered back up. I'm addressing yes. yeah. Kathy um, Chandler. I'm Kathy Chandler from the library and uh, that is what the library board is just now starting to get traction on to, to try and get that done in concert with the city. Okay. Rob, let me tell you. Just so I'm clear, you've got back in um, parking here, and it correct that slow slow in fast out, but you've got head in here, so it's we are, we we are fast in slow. You're changing that. We're changing that to be like this. To be like that. And so like my next question: with this one directional, what need would anybody have to use this street as a pedestrian in a car, other than getting to the bank? And have you considered having it only accessible to the bank? I mean, because why would a car want to want to not go to Main Street here to turn this way and shortcut it that way? There's deliveries uh, to the library. There's deliveries to okay. to the courthouse, to, to the jail. So there there but is. Those are all kind of government. Uh, more so, uh, there's not. There's no commercial entity within that area. We still have a book drop in the yeah. uh, alleyway, so yeah, they would yeah. have to go beyond the bank. Um, and that's the handicap access side to the library as well? Uh, there is. Uh, yeah. uh, there's there's actually better handicap access, I guess, from the parking garage out oh, using okay. the elevator up. Uh, but the, the, it gives an op, uh, multiple option. And our yeah. plan still is to regrade the alley to make it a much safer in and to uh, coordinate with the Mill Street project, which you may be familiar with, mm -hmm. and uh, work with the library and the, and the um, Galena Plaza project so that we make that, that crossing of the Mill Street uh, sidewalk and the alley uh, appear more as all part of the entrance to the library rather than uh, this uh, this dangerous chasm that we have now that you go from sidewalk to 
any wampus uh, alley to the entrance of the uh, library. My next question is that the entrance to this alleyway, the library alley, is a very steep slope off of Mill Street. Is that going to be regraded? That's what I was just referring to, that, that we want to regrade that so that it, it, it's contingent on some uh, adjoining properties uh, 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 working with us on, on resolving those grades. But yes, it's our intent to make that uh, very uh, acceptable and easy drive in. And, and lastly, I'd like to just address the same concern that Steve brought up is that if this bus is only going this way, the door to this bus is on the right-hand side. So if you do have pedestrian drive traffic, you're going to have people stepping out of that bus into traffic as opposed to stepping out of that bus onto a sidewalk. And to me, that's a disaster waiting to happen. I know you said that it's going to be more pedestrian feel on that whole alleyway, but if you've got cars that can freely cut Main Street or cut this intersection and drive through here, that bus stops, opens its door, and there's a car behind it, just as someone stepping out of that bus. At rush hour, the traffic engineer uh, found there were seven vehicles an hour uh, yeah. that use that alley. All so it takes is one at the right time. That's, that's, <laughs> that's correct. And, and RAFTA has the same situation at the uh, roundabout uh, bus stop. So they have a bus stop that the door Round opens into the street? In, into the bus area. And you either walk around the back of the bus or in front of the bus. So it's, it's, it's not ideal, but it does occur in other locations. And certainly here, uh, we're going to continue to work on that and see what we can do so that we minimize any conflict. Um, but uh, there's very little there's very little business except for the bank that uses the alley and for people that want to shortcut uh, the uh, light at Mill and, and Main Street. With the two-way circulation, people shortcut it going both directions, and that may account for most of the traffic. Um, I, I guess what you could do is, is similar to a school bus, we could have uh, some blinking lights and, and a swing out a stop sign just to alert any traffic behind that yeah. some and flashers. Certainly, certainly we may raise a section of it or something so that we, we provide other devices that makes it very apparent that this is a pedestrian crossing, first of all, because we do have uh, on the, on the uh, west side of, or on the, on the west side of North Galena, all these directions, on the west side of North Galena, there still is a sidewalk that crosses that alley that is somewhat blind because of the configuration of that building, and there should really be uh, pedestrian crossing lanes there, so th and that's part of that bus stop area. So there's, I think overall, we'll be looking at how we can uh, maximize the improvement of pedestrian safety throughout that area. Rachel? Yeah, I mean, clearly you had a lot of different demands pushing and pulling on this, right? But I really could see some sort of apron on this corner and it'd be set up so that the pickup is on that corner and, and people step off, as you said, to something that physically is almost like a safety island or something. Yeah. And, and it's because it, I, I'm worried a little less about the traffic than I am about the police cars now moving very quickly from that far side and around the bus and how do they pass the bus and the people. But leave that to you. I, I wanted to go back a little further to Michael's question and appreciate him raising the issue. But so to be clear, it's currently being designed so that the structural support for the weight of a future addition of a library is being designed and will be built in at the same time you have the roof peeled back. We are hoping that that works as smoothly as we all uh, envision it to be. We certainly would like to move ahead with our schedule, yes. uh, which is 100% design detail um, the end of July and then getting into implementation documents so that we can bid and be under construction early in 14. Mm -hmm. Now, we've had, we've had that date go back maybe to 12. So um, we keep working towards a goal 
And that goal, for various reasons, as you say, a lot of competing interest has, has pushed that. But in 07 was the last uh, request by the inspecting engineers to get the surface fixed. And we are now in 13, talking about 14, leaning toward 15. Uh, we need to get it fixed. Uh, and so yes. uh, we've asked the library to move as rapidly as possible. Sure. And if I could just be clear, because Rachel, I think your question is, you know, is, is it being designed? And the design for that will act, would actually be the library's responsibility because they're doing the support. <laughs> What we've come to agreement on is um, what we'd be designing to, which is um, the 60 feet versus our, our current easement goes out to 37 or oh, 44. 44. 44. I always get that number wrong. But uh, at, <clears throat> at any rate, that we've reached agreement that, okay, the, the design would go to 60 feet and the city's good with that, the, the county's good with that, makes more sense. And then we would actually be taking responsibility for the engineering about what needs to happen to reinforce the supports that are on that existing wall at 60 feet. And so that, that would be our responsibility, but we've worked through um, all the issues as to whether we should be going to 60 feet or, or 44 feet. And, and are we going means. to be working with the same engineering firm so that whoever's engineering the roof repairs doesn't look at the engineering for the structural support and say, well, those two don't mesh? They're two different. Yeah. They're two different firms. Yeah. Okay. And how, how will we mesh their work products? Well, the, the city will be having our structural engineers review it for the interest of the city and the protection of the city asset, uh, but certainly in a cooperative way so that we can get through it. So, um, and, and what we've agreed to is that we would <coughs> mutually agree um, to or approve any design before any construction or reinforcement was done and that you know the city's interest is the viability of the parking garage and our interest is the viability of the library so as our experts agree we'll have a solution to move forward on Thank you. okay any other questions you've heard some of our concerns you can pass that on to your side of the street <laughs> you that? Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, John. Okay, our next uh, memory of uh, uh, interest is a uh, budget supplemental request. It um, has to do with what we've been seeing with, with a number of our projects. Uh, we had scheduled this year to replace the roof on the courthouse uh, and the library. Um, our bids came back higher um, than uh, was estimated. You may recall that we did a facilities condition audit um, that was completed just as I was coming out, I believe it was about two years ago, is that right, that through FCA? Yeah. Um, and we had started programming those projects based on their estimates into our capital plan. Um, this is one project that uh, came in higher uh, than, than those estimates, and so uh, it impacts two funds. Uh, one fund is the library fund. Uh, the other fund, uh, the library fund for the roof replacement on the library, and then it also affects general fund capital for the um, courthouse replacement. Um, what we have suggested is reprioritizing uh, the capital plan for the general fund uh, to cover that cost difference, and uh, we have Jack and, and Jody here today to talk about what those implications are. Um, we are suggesting um, bringing in uh, one project into the roofing project, which is heat tape in the library fund, but um, we don't have many other alternatives as far as projects that we would reprogram in the library funds. We are asking for use of fund balance there. And then if you'd like Jack to kind of go through some of the changes. Sure. So I'm Jack Wheeler, facilities project manager. The uh, on the, the courthouse fence restoration was a project that was uh, funded to be done this year and after looking at the fence and talking to everybody, we feel that the fence does not need restoration at this point, um, that it is uh, 
in the theme of the courthouse. It is a historic fence in it. And we are in the regular maintenance of the fence. It will be repainted and things like that. That's, that won't, the programming of that won't change. Um, the courthouse uh, ADA compliance project had stair, new stair railings on the big staircase that goes upstairs. Um, don't feel that they're necessary for one. Um, it would be in addition to the historic woodwork that's there. Um, so we take that off the table. And there's uh, money budgeted for a first floor fountain, drinking fountain in the courthouse, and we don't drink the water in the courthouse. We, we supply water to the people that are in the courthouse um, because of the historic plumbing. Is it lead, lead plumbing? Uh, there's a number of different, different things. things. There's, there, it's old and there is some lead in the pipes. Do we have not potable drinking water in the restrooms over the wash sinks? In the courthouse? Yeah, I mean, we, we should have that if we're not drinking the water because mm -hmm. people can go in the restroom and use that water to, you know, out the sink. Some, we have signs in You the do have signs, that's why I was wondering. Yeah, it says not to drink the water. Okay, yeah. that's good. When we went under contract for the architectural services and engineering services for the redesign of the courthouse plaza, uh, we have a $50,000 savings in that line item, leaving money in contingency for reimbursables and things like that. Um, we had uh, money budgeted to build a brick uh, tower that matches the exterior of the jail to address an air intake issue in the jail where uh, vehicle exhaust is goes into the building if a vehicle is left idling in a certain spot down by the lower garage as opposed to doing uh, spending the money to build a completely enclosed brick tower uh, we're saying that w the money's better spent to address the safety issue uh, do it with HVAC ducting above the roof line to redirect then the intake and uh, push that out since we, we're looking at different space usages for the basement of the jail right now as we go through the space study that we're doing o on the overall county. There's a lot of questions that come up about that space, so instead of redefining that with work on the exterior of the building, we just address it above the roof line for right now to handle the safety issue, which brings a $53,000 savings in. Uh, the, there was an ADA compliance cell based on the facility conditions audit. They came back and said we should have one. In reality, the, the trigger for us to have an ADA compliance cell is a renovation on the jail itself. Um, right now, the needs for the ADA compliance cell are, are done with uh, um, mutual aid agreements with the, with the other counties that have ADA compliance cells. So if we need to house somebody, we can move them down Valley. We don't need so until we decide what the long-term plan is with the jail and how that fits we're saying it's better not to spend that money um, it's not required at this time by code uh, and that brings up a fifty thousand dollar savings so the total savings one hundred eighty one thousand um, dollars out of the general fund i believe um, the seventy three thousand dollars is the the courthouse roof went out to bid it was bid through the u.s community's national procurement process because we felt we'd get better reach on the bids and we did have people bid as far as kansas we had five good proposals come in um, and the contractor we'd like to select out of that which i'm not positive is the lowest but it's lower it's not the highest either um, there's a seventy three thousand dollar cost overrun compared to the budgeted line item um, So that's what the that's what the budget supplemental for the courthouse is. In the library on the library, uh, it's we we had eighty three thousand dollars eighty thousand dollars in a heat tape line item, which was for other roof repairs as well as heat tape. The heat tapes held up well. Uh, if we take that in the budgeted ninety one thousand dollars for the roof replacement that's in the library fund right now we have a cost over on a seventy two thousand dollars on the roof both of those the courthouse and the library have a ten percent contingency built in above the bid bid prices 
<laughs> yeah, go ahead, Michael. They're, they're not cost overruns. Yeah. We haven't spent yeah. any money. They're, they're, they're estimate, higher estimates. Yes. <clears throat> the, um, on the courthouse, and I think I asked this um, a while ago, are there any uh, grants available through the Historical Society of Trust uh, to do some of this work? Jack or Jody? Have we looked into that at all? The state historical? Yes. We have not looked into it. We have not looked into it uh, for the courthouse. Yeah, it seems like that would be a project that would uh, work for their, um, those grants as a historical, not only a historical structure, but a public civic historical structure. It's something that we should look into. Yeah, I think typically, I mean, we, we can certainly look into that and try and take advantage. We're, we're obviously going to be running up against some um, construction deadlines. Typically, I think those have been more successful when you're doing more of a restoration versus a maintenance project. I, I, I don't know that general maintenance as, as those types of projects are as competitive for those grants, but we can certainly take a look at that. Yeah, I mean, you can look at the Capitol Dome. Well, yeah. <laughs> but just, just as an example, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's really a restoration, but it's maintenance but as well. A, that, that's, a, that's a little more visible than our membrane on top of the, yeah. <laughs> right, but, but when, when, a, when a membrane fails, yeah. we, we saw what happened to the Emma town yeah. site without that roofing membrane, the whole building collapsed. Yeah. And, and it costs exponentially more to have that fixed. Absolutely. Versus, so I just think it's something to, uh, to look into. Uh, the other question and concern I have is, uh, Jack, when you said that when you put these out to bids, you got proposals as far away as Kansas. And as, and as we've seen that these projective costs have come in higher than what we originally anticipated, a lot of those costs are due to uh, the, um, uh, to those who are bidding these projects not aware of the true costs of actually moving in and uh, bringing materials in. And so to look at uh, a firm from Kansas who probably doesn't really have, unless they've done work here in the past. Yeah, I don't think like that's it, a firm we still. Yeah, but just in general, I'm just saying it seems like if we could, if we could have the opportunity to uh, look at firms that have, who are outside the valley who have done work in the county in the past to understand the, the externalities of bringing of the cost of doing a project, we may have a better, more accurate bid to begin with. But, and George, I think that's one of the, the things that we're seeing in this environment is when we have relied on outside entities uh, for estimates. So in this case, these estimates came out of our facilities conditions audit. And you know we, we had the recent experience with the, the underpass that those are coming in significantly lower when we have bid or, or when we've done the estimating with our staff and we felt comfortable doing that those projects are coming in budget or or under and so we're going to have to do I, I think as rob suggested when we go into 2014 we're going to have to rebaseline our um, capital plan and and really rely I think more on our internal expertise to, to do that. And so Jack's already, uh, and Jody are already going through uh, the five years, next five years of facilities projects and looking to rebaseline those. And we can bring those forward um, with the 2014 budget. But as you can see, we've had some also, we, we've reduced scope, but we also had some savings from other projects where we did the estimating um, to, to put in front of you. And, and also, when, when we did take this out to bid, there was a mandatory on-site site meeting, and I met with all the contractors that put proposals in, and they all have done work in Aspen and Vale. So they are familiar with the mountains. Good, thanks. Any other questions? Steve? You mentioned on the library roof that the roof underlayment and insulation have deteriorated. Is it possible doing the re-roofing to upgrade the insulation on the library while before the final roof is put on? The, the insulation that is being specced on the replacement is a higher
quality and a slightly higher R value than what is in there. We can increase the R value even more. We will we would get into a cost increase. Um, I'm not sure that the increasing it any more than what we've spec'd is worth the cost increase. Because we get into different flashings and elevations and things like that because of where the insulation goes on the roof. Well, I understand that this summary that's laid out in this supplemental request, but I don't, in the, in the funding summary, I don't see the $53,000 savings from the jailhouse listed in any of the funding summary. I can address that. There's the, the savings that <clears throat> were identified at the bottom of the first page of the supplemental request yeah. uh, total 181000 but we don't need that much in funding for the, the additional cost to the courthouse roof. And so we, uh, we've identified more savings than what we're actually needing to use right at the moment. So we'll actually have another supplement of an additional 53 Potentially an additional fifty-three thousand dollars in savings we, down the road. We need to do a supplemental for that, but, but we will probably have that much in okay. savings. Even though you're listing it as a savings in the description, <coughs> here, you're not, not putting it into this supplemental. We're not request. actually reducing the budget. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're just making it a net zero for the general fund portion of this. We what we did when this roof project came up and seeing this trend. We went ahead and went through every facilities project we have planned this year. And we made decisions about um, rescoping and realigning to be sure um, that we're in budget. And so we wanted to use this as an opportunity to tell you um, what, what we are thinking, even though we may not need those savings from the jail project here. Um, certainly, Right now, given that we're seeing this escalation happen, we want it to go a little bit farther than absolutely necessary for the remainder of the year. And so we, we re-baselined. We went through every line in the facilities capital plan for this year and, and rebased our expectations. And, and just a procedural question. Why a supplemental request from two different funds as opposed to two supplemental requests? It just seems to me it'd be easier to look at it as a library request and a capital fund request. We could do it. We, we bid them as a single bid and a single um, the, um, project, project. And, and so um, they, they were always funded out of these two separate funds. And so um, I, I, if the board would prefer in the future that um, if we have it coming out of separate funds, we divide it into two separate requests. That's certainly something we can do. We actually thought it might be easier for you to track having it all in one place and, and the two separate funds, but we're happy to do it either way. Rachel? Yeah, I'd like to follow up on Steve's point that he raised about the insulation, and I guess without having any memo on it or information, <laughs> Um, it seems that the cost alone shouldn't be the deciding factor. It should also be the <clears throat> energy savings by going to a higher R factor and emissions and our emission goals as a county as well and how much you know, annual savings in the library's operating budget you know, and, and how many years of payback there might be for that increased value. And, I realize you're saying there's other work but that would then be required to go much higher, but I still think it'd be well worth looking at that trade-off, you know, because it's a, yeah. to me, it's a one-time opportunity to get in there. You're not going to want to do it again. This is, it's being specced as a 20-year or 30-year roof? 20-year. A 20-year roof. And so I, I would just at least like to know what that nominal, the difference mm -hmm. between those are, both for the library board to make its recommendation to use its budget or or for us to yeah. review as well. If I can make a suggestion, we did do a, um, an energy audit um, that identified a, a number of projects. I do not recall that this insulation was identified as a... I thought we left the library off of a lot of that audit note because we were looking at the library edition at that time. But so we, I thought the library was included in the audit, but we didn't do any of the projects in the library. 
Is that correct? Or did we? I believe the library was included, but it was not. So it, we did it in the audit. We just didn't do any of the, the projects. So I think what might be the, the quickest way to answer that question be to go back to that audit and see if this insulation it was identified at that time. And if so, we could probably pretty quickly bring back what the project would be. And if it wasn't, um, it probably wasn't identified as a major factor for energy savings. Sure. Does that seem like a reasonable? Yeah, that, that seems reasonable. Okay. I just would like to have a little more investigation about it at this time. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Well, Jody, yeah? Well, I would also say that if we're going to come back, um, maybe we can come back with grant deadlines and that, that kind of information for you to make a decision on that because most of those grant deadlines are, they could be like October, which would mean we would totally miss this year. And so, just to give you that information. Yeah, but I, I understand that. But it, we may, it'd be good information to have just for future uh, work at the courthouse, just to know that. Okay. What I would suggest is making a decision on the supplementals, and then these might be uh, scope changes then that we would work out through the, the contractor or future budget so we know whether we're moving forward with this or, and, or not. And just to, I did. When we did the courthouse sprinkler project, I worked with the Colorado Historic Fund grant program, and John is absolutely correct. They, if we try to put a roof in there and general maintenance roof replacement, it's going to fall way down. The the grant deadline for that, the applications need to be in by April 1st, and they make a decision in August. So to get, and that's the one that I would think that we have the best shot at, and I don't think it's a very good. I don't think we have a very good shot at it. And so we'd be putting this project off to even find out if we have the grant funding till next August. Yeah, I'm not saying delay. I'm just saying, have you looked at it? And, and, and it's, it's, we should just explore that even for future mm -hmm. opportunities. I will. So with that, is the board okay with, with these? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> our last MOI is um, we, in the 2013 budget, we had approved a, a pot of money to make um, wage adjustments. And at that time, uh, we had indicated to the board that um, we had come back and, and let you know what, what we were doing uh, with those funds. And there's really uh, two levels as uh, is outlined in your memo first uh, we had a um, employee committee make recommendations um, regarding uh, how they would like to see those funds uh, dispersed in the pay plan and at the same time uh, we conducted a market analysis of our uh, ranges and so today really what we're here to do is just give you a high-level overview of where the uh, employee committee came out on their recommendations and then also uh, an update on our process at looking at our ranges and the types of things we're learning and the, the types of uh, you know what's going well there and types of challenges we may have to address for the future so uh, we have Danette and Victoria McGrath uh, from a graph consulting here to talk to you about those things. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as John indicated, uh, we had several meetings with our compensation advisory committee to look at the allocation methodology or methodology or process we were going to follow for the three percent uh, uh, wage adjustments budgeted for this year. And after some lengthy discussions with our uh, leadership team, um, we. We compromised on a uh, allocation based on a flat 3% wage adjustment if an employee falls within uh, solidly within their current pay grade range. In addition to that, uh, the committee felt strongly for those employees that were approaching their respective range max at the range max or currently over their range max that they would receive a uh, variable percent increase of the three percent up to the range max the rest of the percent uh, difference would be in a lump sum contribution service acknowledgement 
uh, if an employee were at the range max, it would be a flat $1,000 lump sum uh, service and contribution acknowledgement. So uh, that was approved on May 9th. And uh, our wage adjustment effective date this year is June 16th. So we're fast approaching uh, and preparing for uh, that process. Regular full-time and part-time employees hired before January 1st, 2013 are eligible and as, long, as well as returning seasonal employees. Um, and I do have examples of the uh, range max, approaching range max, if you'd like to see those. I know it's easy to say. Sure, that'd again. be great. Would you like to see some of those? Uh, can I turn this thing off and that other thing on? All right, I might have to shuffle this around a little bit. All right. Here we have an example of uh, an employee by the name of John Doe <laughs> who is approaching their range maximum. John happens to be in grade level H. John's current rate of pay is $28.75. Uh, he meets our eligibility criteria in terms of his hire date before January 1st, 2013 for wage adjustment consideration. We can see that uh, in pay grade H, in this example, the minimum is $19.99. The maximum is $28.98. So John being at $28.75. Uh, I'm getting really lost because I don't see, even see $28.75. Oh, it's up the top. Yeah. I'm getting, really, and I'm getting really dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, Thank you. Well, I knew there happen. had to be a better way to do that. Thank there you. you go. There, yeah, go. Okay. there, now you can see the whole thing? Like I said, I can't see the red, but that's okay. Um, so 28.75 is the employee's current rate of pay. So um, at 28.75, you can see that the percent wage adjustment needed to top out is a low 0.8 percent. Um, so John Doe's wage is adjusted to the range maximum, which you can see at 28.98. The remaining percent, 3 percent of the wage adjustment pool, 2.2 percent then, is calculated out into a lump sum. And in this example, where the lump sum value exceeds $1,000 cap, that's adjusted to $1,000. So that is an example of an employee that is currently approaching the wage the wage uh, reigns ma maximum. Can I ask a question about this chart? Sure. What is market point versus our minimum and our hiring max? I mean, in our, our maximum? Victoria is going to get more into mar what market point is for you, so you have a good understanding of that. that. That is basically where we positioned our jobs in the external market. So that's our competitive point. And when you say salary of twenty eight seventy five, is that an hourly wage? Yeah. We've tried to get people work for that annually, but they yeah. just <laughs> <laughs> so how do you how do you determine the um, the the gap that ended up being a thousand dollars or reduced to a thousand dollars there based on a salary employee based on a historical record of of hours worked per the year, or is it? Just does don't you have to have an annual wage for that? No, no. Okay. Just an, we just basically took the hourly rate of pay times the eligible wage adjustment percent, the variable percent that the employee is eligible for, that would top them out. <coughs> took the remaining percent of the three, um, broke that down into a um, hourly rate, multiplied that by 2080, and arrived at the lump sum value. And so that's where I'm getting at. You multiplied it by 2080, which yeah. is a 40 hour work week for a full year, mm -hmm. even though the employee may only be working 32 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So they're actually getting more than a 3% pay increase in that standard because they're not working a 40 hour yeah. work week. Uh, we will adjust that based on their current FTE equivalent. Okay, but their FTE equivalent is full time. So that's between 32 hours and 40 hours? No, no. 
now. If it's 40, 40 hours a week is an FTE, yeah. everything below that is a fraction of an FTE. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so this is an example of John Doe, uh, still grade level H, uh, at or over the range maximum. Uh, John's current hourly rate of pay is 28.98, which is the range max. So in this example, it's pretty clear there is no 3% wage adjustment applied to this particular uh, employee, but a $1,000 service contribution acknowledgement. This is just a, another example for you, of, similar to the first example, but a little bit greater split. This uh, is an employee approaching at the range maximum again. In this example, 2850 range max uh, per hour. The employee earns 2898 range max again to be consistent with our examples. In this example, the wage adjustment percent or variable percent required to top out a little bit greater than the last example, 1.7%. The percent remaining of the 3% is 1.3. Calculating that out, the annual amount came out to $771, so slightly below that 1,000 because the majority is captured on the front end to top the employee out. Any questions? Rob? So, and, and maybe you're going to get to this, so I might be jumping the gun here, but in those three examples, the first employee got less than a 3% raise. The second employee got less than a 3% raise. The third employee got a 3% raise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's really no way other than we, if we allocate an additional increase of more than 3% to somebody that we're, we're going to expend our budgeted 3% of total payroll. It'll come in under our 3% because there will be a a good handful of employees that will get under a 3% raise. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we're really not raising our payroll by 3%. Well, we're not done yet, because yeah. you only heard half the story. The, uh, the other part is there are a handful, not a lot, but there are a handful of employees that are going to need some market adjustments. Okay. Um, and we also, the bigger story, that I think you're going to hear today to, to preview the rest of the discussion is over the past several years we've had a lot of compression um, and, and what that means is that employees that have been with us for quite a while that you might expect to be farther along in the pay, pay range than somebody who maybe has been hired in the last year or so that hasn't necessarily happened and it's not necessarily happened for a couple of reasons. One, when we did have money, um, we were moving ranges, but we weren't moving people with the ranges. Mm -hmm. we, were, we still had a, another way of moving them through, so that caused compression. And then, of course, in the last three years when we've had a pay freeze, that automatically causes compression because you can have somebody here for, for three years that's starting at the same rate as, as somebody who's been here for six months. and so. We've had some dual pressures around compression, and so we're going to look to apply some dollars and actually some, some other savings we've identified to starting to detangle some of those compression issues for our employees. So we'll potentially have a pool of money that we can put towards decompressing those tangled Yeah, issues. and I think that's going to be kind of a multi-year strategy, quite frankly. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's time for me to step in. That would be a good cat. Yeah. <laughs> before, before I do, before I have you jump in, Victoria, thank you. I do want to add that uh, Victoria is going to be discussing our our market analysis process. Uh, but part of the wage allocation included in that in the market adjustment are two things. One, where required. Uh, we will implement an additional 3% adjustment for those employees who have been in their current position for at least three years and who are less than 15% above their respective pay grade uh, salary range minimum. Uh, so three years and less than 15%. So I wanted to point that out as part of that wage allocation process too. Can I ask a question there? You said an additional 3%? Yes. So a 3% on top of this that, adjustment. That's correct. So potentially a 6% pay increase. There are instances where we will see 6% increases. Okay. Rachel? Uh, 
I want you to explain, either in your comments, Victoria, or to Jeanette, or as we go back and forth, the, and I'm not saying I think it's a bad idea, but it's just the, the service contribution acknowledgement is a, it sounds like a funny thing to me. It sounds like, well, maybe their range should be $1,000 higher, rather than say, here's 1000 because you're not getting a raise anymore because you've hit the top of your range. It, it, would that be every year? You know, I mean, I just, it, and I know we're dealing with how we were trying to adjust for this year, but it just seems like we're creating a thing, and is it a, a program that we will continue always, partially? I mean, it's just... We, we've, made it, we've made it very clear, I think, that this would not necessarily be an ongoing thing, but the county has had a practice of providing for some kind of bonus program, yeah. um, and, and whether employees are, are topped out or not and so um, this is really you know I think came out of a lot of um, very robust discussions with our employee advisory committee about what was important for our employees and what was important to them and actually I, I think they named the service contribution um, bonus that that was uh, um, has has been put on the table and um, they felt very strongly that um, you know all employees have been living through a certain level of, of pay freeze and and such um, we continue to feel some of the inflationary pressures just like everyone oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, is um, and that as we were able to put this pool of money together that um, all employees should have some benefit from it and so that that is why the uh, employee compensation committee I believe came up with this recommendation to have an opportunity for for all employees to have some recognition um, because it's not only the pay freeze that matters we had a lot of reductions in force across the county and we didn't necessarily change the scope of what we were doing so we've been asking folks to do more with with less too and I think it's a recognition of that it just, it just sits funny with me because it feels like if I was that employee and I was topped out and I got this wonderful service acknowledgement, mm -hmm. um, appreciate and why the ways didn't you freeze, get it? Yeah. and then why won't I get it in 2014, it'll seem like a salary cut. Okay. And we, we had exactly that, that same, oh yeah, that, that exact um, conversation. We had a lot of robust discussions and uh, a lot of what you see has been a compromise between the compensation committee and section leaders myself asking some of these same questions but this was one that the employee committee I think was particularly passionate Very about passionate. and so I, I felt okay. it was important well, to respond to it I just want to make sure the conversation's been had the conversation's <laughs> definitely been had <laughs> I think uh, it you know to kind of put some of this stuff in perspective and um, back in 2007 um, I know most of you were too young to be members of the council at that point at a uh, time, but at that point in time, we were brought in to take a look at your performance evaluation process and in turn ended up looking at your compensation process because the, the, the county wanted to put a performance merit-based system in to a compensation system that at that point in time was a little broke. And by that I mean a, a couple of ways. Uh, Previous to 2007, there had been adjustments to the schedules, but those adjustments were inconsistent, and so there were positions of a higher pay grade earning less than positions of a lower pay grade. In addition to that, at that point in time, your salaries had dramatically fallen uh, below what was considered any type of average market rate. In fact, I just kind of pulled up the report the other day uh, when I knew I was coming out here, and at that point in time, you had almost... 67% uh, of the positions that were surveyed were at least 30% below the average market rate to a tune in some cases of more than $3,000. And at that point in time, we designed a system that was basically uh, to align itself with the market, i.e. the market point, what was the external market doing. But also, in addition to that, there were several components with that. One, that you were to uh, continue to look at keeping those pay ranges 
uh, up to date with whatever the the uh, uh, external market was doing, usually kind of looking at your CPI type of a range. But then there was also supposed to be a merit component where people would move through based upon some criteria of performance. And we looked also uh, another piece of that puzzle was also supposed to be an extra incentive or a bonus type system or if we we gone above and beyond the call of duty it either would have been a bonus or a percentage added to the base pay and unfortunately through no fault of anybody's other than the economy um, that was great in 2007 and it worked wonderful and then 2008 came and so what has happened over the couple of years uh, since that time period is that the the county has actually done a very good job of maintaining its wage scale uh, to the external market uh, when we looked at it again after uh, Danette and her staff put together market comparables that all that were talked uh, with all the sectional leaders, uh, when you looked at it out of the 80-some uh, positions that were surveyed, you only had about 3% of those positions or about 20-some positions that had actually fallen below the external market rate. So you no longer have the problem that you had back in 07 with those wages being so dramatically below the average market rate. And one thing you have to consider when you look at the average market rate, you're looking at all different types of uh, municipal organizations throughout all of the county because uh, we have relied on the um, Mountain States survey as well as the county and so some of that's not taking into account as well the unique economics of, of this particular area being within the city of Aspen. So on the, on the positive side is you definitely have maintained those salary schedules. But what has happened is that because due to economics you were unable to look at implementing any of the pieces that would move someone through the schedule, we're now uh, running into the fact where, as, as John has indicated, you have people that have been here four or five years that got a bump back in 07, but they really haven't moved anywhere since then. And you're bringing in new people at higher rates, and so you're getting this collision around the middle of folks, you know, you're not moving through the schedule. And, and my, my argument is that if you're going to put a schedule out there, then at least there should be some mechanisms to move through it, or, or don't, don't give them the schedule. The same thing with the schedule to kind of address your piece is when you look at a, a salary range, the minimum to the maximum, what you're basically saying is this is the value that the county now places on the position. We're not talking about individual here. So if I'm at my max, basically the county is saying, or any organization is saying, this is as high as we value that position. And now that doesn't mean that that person cannot get any more increases, but typically that it goes in the form of a bonus where it's not impacting that range. Because one of the things that happened before 2007 is that max was never increased, but people were allowed to move beyond the max. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, where is the max? Uh, so if you're going to have a salary range, you need to put some provisions in to not only establish what those ranges are, but then move people through that range. And so we attempted uh, early on when um, Pitkin County contacted me again to try to fix all of that. And there's just no way you can fix and look at making sure your salary ranges are up to date, uh, adjusting those that are not up to date and bringing those people to now the new minimum and solve the issue of people within that salary range. And what I think we've done at this point in time is at least established a very sound system where the market point makes sense. You know, the goal is to get people to that market point or position point or whatever we want to talk about. But the next phase of the project needs to then say, what are we going to do to move those folks through? And that needs to be a discussion on, on resources as well as what kind of merit system, because your charter indicates that it, you know, some sort of merit system should be in place. And I think we can go back to some of those ideals that we had back in 07, but <coughs> fit them into what's fiscally feasible at this point in time. Any questions? Well, what's the relationship between the market you're talking about and the free market? Well, the, it, and Danette, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Mountain States Employers Council, so where there's 
private sector comparisons where we can get those. Um, those are included in the Mountain States Employers Council data, the, the survey data we get. And so for private entities, for example, and I, I assume that's what you mean by, by free market, Michael. So we're, we are capturing that information. And so um, we, we have where, where we can get it, both private and public sector benchmarks that are going into this data. There are some benchmarks um, that you just don't necessarily find out in, in the private sector as a public entity. And in those cases, we're simply benchmarking against um, comparison organizations, you know, comparable organizations, either municipalities or counties. Um, now, I do think that we'll probably need to get into one. One of my goals is that we don't do this once every seven years because it's it's too easy to lose sight, and so that we're updating this. Um, I was going for annually, but the net assures me every other year is good enough, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. She, she's going to hit me if I ever do it every year, I think. But um, it is a big project, but so that we can, um, you know, keep on top of that. But we'll also need to probably keep checking in on our benchmarks to make sure we're getting good information because Mountain States Employers Council and any survey, any survey you use has some gaps in it. But we are capturing private sector info. Rob? <clears throat> to what extent with the market comparison, is um, our retirement plan taken into account, our Social Security plan, our health insurance plan, our county match to our retirement plan, and those sorts of things? Because I think there are far greater benefits in this than a lot of free market. Um, and that's the issue that you have to be very cautious about when you're looking at private sector data because what you're basically talking about is a total compensation comparison. Yeah. And when you're looking at your salary ranges, the only thing you are looking at is base compensation. You're not taking into all those, other, those, those other types of benefits, which definitely need to be looked at. In private sector versus public sector, usually the total compensation mix is very different. And again, now I'm, I'm painting with a very wide brush here, which means I'm being very stereotypical, but if you look at private sector data, you usually have higher than average type of salaries and lower than average type of benefits, and in the public sector, it's the opposite. Now, granted, I understand with health care and some of those issues, the, the playing fields being significantly leveled, um, than it had been in the past. In the past, people didn't join governmental entities because of the base salary. They joined because of the other types of benefits that were afforded. Um, and again, that, that is shifting. So I think, you know, it, it, I think it's very um, wise on a, on a regular basis to either even do things where you can go out and do survey data, and we've done that for some of our clients where we look at total compensation and we look at the contributions to retirement plans. Um, now, in that case, you really are going to have to stick to municipal organizations because you're not comparing apples to apples otherwise, but looking at some of those benefits and even providing on an occasional basis, because it takes a lot of work to do, a total benefit statement, a total compensation statement, because people sometimes only hone in on what my net pay is, and they don't realize the costs of all the other types, health insurance, dental, et cetera, retirement and whatnot. So I think it's always wise and prudent to bring those forward on a, on a regular basis so people see the, the full cost of what it costs. And we are working on that because we, we haven't necessarily done that total compensation look. That is something that um, Danette's been, been working on pulling together so that we have it for our organization. Finding, doing the comparables is um, much more challenging than the payroll analysis that, that we've done here. And the other issue, too, is when you're looking at costs of services, especially benefits, there are so many nuances where it may be a high cost here, but the, it's a higher deductible plan, and it's, a, you know, so you're really getting it. Plan designs and things of that nature become a lot more difficult, but you can very narrowly look at it from a cost perspective. And from a compensation advisory committee perspective, they were asked uh, initially to take on our compensation plan and making some recommendations around allocation. Uh, we did complete a compensation, total compensation strategy statement that we will be sharing with you uh, in the near future. And in that, we cover the five components that we felt were extremely important to maintain our ability to attract talent 
continue to engage our current employees and motivate and, and retain them. So uh, the first bite out of that cake, if I may, uh, is our compensation plan. But we have targeted uh, training and development, benefits, uh, et cetera, as far, part of our five components. We'll be looking at those both individually and then uh, as a group to see how we how competitive we remain. Thank you. Um, just a, a comment and then maybe a, a future request, but it seems that in some ways we, between 2007 and now, as you said, Victoria, maintained our range as well compared to the survey information. It's at some level because a lot of those ranges in the free market fell. Mm -hmm. I mean, people came down to catch up with us, not the other way around. And you know, it seems that the private market is starting to ramp back up, uh, perhaps not rapidly yet, but it is a variable that it can ramp up very rapidly at times. And so, and that's where we mm -hmm. would never have the budget to do that sort of ramp up rapidly. And so, uh, I think it's really important to uh, make a little hay while the sun is shining, as it were, and, and get ourselves in the right position. Um, but I'm wondering if perhaps we could get a one or two page, and maybe this is impossible, about the interplay with employees who come to us who had previously worked in that social security system versus and now they're in a, uh, a contribution from us because it, sometimes it can really almost be a negative. If you yeah. were a long-term employee and putting into the county's compensation program, a retirement program, mm -hmm. yeah, you have many, many years to build it up. But if you had kind of depended on your social security work for your first 25 years of your life or 30, and now you're only going to have five or 10 in the government sector, mm -hmm. that can actually count against your social security payments. Yeah. And so we only put in what would have been a social security payment off of that person's salary. We don't, we don't match their contribution. There's no additional, mm -hmm. you know, employer bonus of if you save an extra three percent a year, we'll save, we'll, we'll, we'll match you. You know, and so I think that to help us understand our compensation packages and its implications, we need a little bit of detail on that history or that, that choice that the county made as to which system we're going to be in and under in the future. I would love to spend some time with you on that because it is actually a growing concern and primarily perception, but myself being one of the examples that you just provided provided having paid into Social Security almost 30 years and coming here. I did my homework for prior to coming to Pitkin County working with the Social Security office and administration in Glenwood Springs. So long story short, Rachel, that also is on our radar because we do have employees who give as their reason for leaving. I need three more years in Social Security so I receive my full benefit. Not understanding, I worked very closely with Tom Oaken on this, not understanding that in my particular example and probably in many others, we're actually coming out a little bit ahead. Not much, but it's it's at least a break even. Um, I had a, a nice conversation with Tom Krushensky with Cora last week on this very point because we, ha we did have another employee leave for that reason. And uh, we're going to spend considerable time with our employees through education and, and with Social Security. Um, but we have to do a better job at explaining that on the front end when we're attracting our talent so they understand exactly what they're being presented with. Okay, well, thanks. I, I, really, I really think that that would be yeah, valuable understood. for all of us. And of course, rules on Social Security could change. We can only get the snapshot in time. Right. But it's important that we both fully inform our employees and, and, and let them strategize. And if I understood you correctly also, Rachel, what you asked for is what's the historical, what is the reason that the county elected to um, uh, go from Social Security into our current plan. So I will get that history for you. I'm very, I'm very interested in that myself. Thank you. Yeah. Well, what's the, the procedure here? This is a, this is a recommend the staff to, to go along accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, is there more information that's going to be brought back to us about the people that are potentially going to be up to 6%, we the additional bonus? structure stuff, uh, no. a resolution that, that this is going to... In, unless the board wants to get in, it, it's not my recommendation that you get into making decisions on individual employees. It's kind of beyond 
the, the board's role. Um, the, what, what we wanted to do is make sure you understood what we were doing um, with the 3% that's already been approved in the budget so to have that explanation and um, you know in, unless the board um, really feels strongly that that's not an appropriate way for us to proceed um, you know you have that opportunity to give us direction now but I think we already have the budget approval and, and that sort of thing to move forward, but we had made a commitment to come back and tell you what, what we were doing and, and make sure that um, you, you consented to, to using the funds that way. Um, as far as the individual pay plan, um, we're still working through the data ourselves, quite frankly. We don't have all the data put together, but we wanted you to understand the process that we're going through. Um, because I do think it's going to play into how we talk about our 2014 budget. And, you know, I think the aha moment for um, us and, and staff at, at the staff level was the level of compression that we have because of, um, you know, just a series of decisions and circumstances, you know, that, that brought us to this point now. And that is probably the thing to untangle before the market starts heating up again. We have a unique opportunity right now to try and untangle some of these compression issues before we get into a situation where we're just trying to keep up with the market. Yeah. So. Now the, uh, yeah, I, I agree that the policy decision from the board was to approve the budget. And we approved a budget of 3% uh, for compensation. And we then at that time he said we will lead that up to the compensation advisory board mm -hmm. to come up with some different scenarios to determine how best to utilize that three percent and within that process you were able to uh uncover or discover uh the issue of con uh, of this compression which which was very valuable in itself and then you came up with a way to uh address that address those who are at the top of the weight scale address those that are in this compression uh, and still maintain within that 3% budget. Yeah. So I support that and I don't think we need to uh, get into the administrative side. That's not our role. Steve? Is the 3%, is the, the bottom line of the total that all the different employees get, is that s sticking to the 3% figure or is the whole thing a be more than three percent or less or do you have so three percent like a pool of money and the way to look at it is we have a pool of personnel dollars mm -hmm. and um, we we increase that by three three percent so everything that we're talking about right now can fit within that pool of personnel dollars so there's no additional budgetary authority that that we're asking for however um, we cannot address the full scope of those compression issues within that 3%. And that's where I say I think that's going to be kind of a multiple year effort and we're going to have to look at applying the, the dollars that we have planned and, and um, funding for personnel to, to keep addressing those issues. So as Victoria pointed out, we're moving people through the range appropriately given their time and, and contribution and performance in our organization. So um, we're going to have to come back to you. We, you know, we have 3% planned across the board. Um, if we have some opportunities to take care of some of the compression issues, maybe that's something that we'll want to talk about more during budget. But for 2013, um, we can't address it all, but we're getting a start on it, and we're doing it within the budget that's been approved. Yeah. I've been... Uh an employee in this same situation and where there was compression involved then mm -hmm. I, I remember and where there had been a wage freeze for mm -hmm. several years so I, I've been on the other side of the the yeah. table on, on that and I I remember feeling really good when the pay rates came through mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm sure that the staff from Picking County will feel the same too. I'll be really glad to get that bump. Yeah. Rachel? Yeah, just as a brief comment, you know, at the Colorado Counties, Inc., uh, there was uh, a bill to increase um, some of the salaries at the uppest levels of the state government, governor, and appointees. It didn't go anywhere. 
but there was side discussion about, say, like sheriff salaries, mm -hmm. and it was really surprising to me to hear uh, a lot of the really small counties with not much budget saying, you've got to raise the sheriff salaries because mm -hmm. we now have chief detectives making $20,000 yeah. a year more than the sheriffs who are capped out, and n no one in the departments want to become sheriff anymore, <laughs> you know, and it gets really hard to, to, to govern mm -hmm. and to, 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 you know, head a department when you, the people under you are making a, a quarter or a third more than you are. And so that, that compression issue is happening mm -hmm. at a level within the state. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Victoria. Nice to be back thank here you again. folks in the back who I'm sure are part of the committee uh, <laughs> that worked on this. Thank you. We're on to future agendas. Yeah, we'll see if we can wrap all this up in the 10 minutes left on our agenda. We really just had uh, one item uh, that I told you I'd come back on, which is uh, June 25th. We had left the joint meeting with the city of Aspen, but it really doesn't look, it looks like that will be more feasible in July. And so um, we'll be taking that off, so you'll, you'll have some time there. And then we've got um, quite a bit of agenda space still to fill as we get into the July months. Okay. I'd say right now we don't have anything on the July 2nd agenda. I'm not sure if any board members are planning on being out the week of July 4th. One. Okay. Okay. So we'll look at that. Uh, any other future agenda items from the board? Okay, we're we'll on to discussion. open discussion. And uh, I'll make this brief too. Um, NACO uh, is looking to have the credential sign for voting. And so, Rachel, I think you're going in July to NACO? Yes. And what they need is for uh, the chairperson of the board to sign the credentials so that Rachel can vote for us. So I just wanted to bring that up and make that. sure we can get George to sign those or <laughs> okay. if we're going to credential Rachel or not <laughs> to vote for us. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and have you, we've got the paperwork filled out for you, George, to, to go ahead and sign that so we can get that turned in. And that's all I have for open discussion today. Okay, board members, open discussion. Rachel? Yeah, I would, um, just uh, give a real brief rundown of having gone to the Western Interstate Region Conference in Flagstaff last week. Um, you know, what was most interesting, there was a lot of discussion about sage grouse and some of the plans to preserve that and keep it off the uh, endangered species list, but was the forest restoration work that they are doing and have done, and particularly the flood mitigation work that they've had to do. Uh, there was a large uh, forest fire in the Coconino National Forest, mm -hmm. and uh, although they knew they were going to have monsoon summer rains in July, it, very quickly after that, they had gone out across the state and gotten every last Jersey barrier they could to help protect homes in that floodplain, and they also said they put out over a million sandbags, and then they had a storm of uh, one inch of rain in 15 minutes. And it totally took absolutely every last bit of that out in a way. And so I have a report I'll, I'll give to John, but I think the numbers uh, coming out of that fire for the flood damage afterwards uh, were close to $30 million. And so people who never had flood insurance because they're not in a mapped FEMA plane at all uh, suffered gravely. And it really was just a great case for how forest treatments in advance and preventing the forest fires, whether it's by using prescribed burn or whatever, is just such an economical uh, investment for the community. And they had something which I hadn't heard of before. And again, for flooding, I tend to think of the Roaring Fork or the Frying Pan or Castle Creek or something like that. Uh, in spring mud and flood season uh, was that they um, have a flood control district and their commissioners are able to raise taxes without voter approval, it's, you know, more standard model across the country. And even with the recession, they had doubled that tax to be able to be able to advance the sort of protection of, of life and property. 
and then the community of Flagstaff passed a $10 million fire mitigation bond with their public to go up and because they realized how vulnerable some of their water supplies were if the fire had just been another couple miles uh, to the west. Uh, and I thought that that was very interesting in a concept that we, you know, we have very limited resources. The city of Aspen has limited resources, but how, how severe um, wildfire could affect all of our economies and sometimes a penny saved is a penny earned. So uh, just wanted to kind of bring that up and, you know, maybe talk a little more in depth about it another time. Thank you, Rachel. Hmm. Okay, if there's nothing else, I'll entertain a motion to go back into executive session. And again, this will be for uh, the purpose of the West Divide litigation and Windstar. I'm not sure if Windstar falls under the same CRS, uh, but the West Divide was the CRS 24-6-4024B. I'm not sure, George. I'm going to need to get a cite from John. Citations are advice from your attorney, and <laughs> which are, which are I, I apologize. I, I should probably know that, but I, I do not off the top of my head. Yeah. Do you want me to step out and call him? Yeah, I, I'm just going to try calling right now. Oh, okay. Well, four B. Four B. So it is the same. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so they will both fall under CRS-24-6-4024B. So moved. Go back into the executive as cited. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Great, thank you. Thank you, Grassroots. So we'll take a 10-minute break while Grassroots... Uh...